for uh, this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to just be cared for by you, be protected by you, be guided and, and brought through uh, times like this. We thank you for continuously helping us to learn and understand from all the interactions of situations and people and circumstances in our lives, not just now, but in everything. Help us to learn how it brings out in us the sin and flesh of our irritations and frustrations and you expose us for the things that need to be addressed and uh, these are symptoms of a deeper problem with how you use things like this to reveal to us opportunities for growth, opportunities for healing, opportunities for uh, correction. And so we thank you for all this opportunity we have. You give us so many things to introspectively look at and see and understand and know that we're always growing, always needing to grow, always needing to rely upon you to grow. You are the water of your of who you are, the living water, your word is the water to breathe life into us and to sustain us and you are that bread of life to to feed us and we 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 need you as our sustenance and yet as we clamor for the grocery stores and are in fear of running out of food at some people's uh, situations of they hoard if only people would think the same way about you the urgency the the priority the the anxiety of oh my goodness I need to spend my time with my God my Savior my Lord my Creator the lover of my soul the Father who endears himself to me more than any other ever will, has been, and ever could. So we thank you, Father, for reminding us in times like this, there's always good that comes out of it and close o opportunities to hear your voice clearer, cut out the clamoring and the distractions, and see more of you. Thank you for aligning this time with an opportunity where you are calling us to be encouraged and exhorted in the book of Hebrews to understand just that, that we all have physical needs, financial needs, emotional, spiritual needs mental needs of just uh, having to get through situations in our life. We're not trivializing those. We know those are all important. We ask that you be our shepherd, our provider, our sustainer, giving and supplying and encouraging us where you know we need it and how we need it for the extended families and families and all the things that are out there, Father. Pray especially right now for the upcoming surgery for, for Sister Vicki. Continue to have her be in, in your hands and continue to prepare those times of healing. So, Father, we thank you so much for all that you have shown us so far in your word continuously through the years. And we look now even more so you being our counselor, our teacher, our guide, our pastor, our shepherd, our coming bridegroom, our sustaining, loving father. Show us in your things and your word that you want us to understand and know and to be different by it. We ask that you, again, be our pastor and teacher at this time. We ask all these things in Ju Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right. Yes, babe. It's not a problem. We'll just start at 7 and on Friday. Uh, we'll start at 7. Sunday will be the same thing because nothing's different there. But Friday night will be uh, earlier because of the curfew potential realities that they're imposing at, at different counties, like I mentioned, around. So we'll start at 7 on Friday until further notice. Um, all right, so, sorry, a little hangnail there is bothering me. All right, so... And the reality of what we've talked about in the book of Hebrews, we're going to pick up on chapter 6 in relation to actually something that you probably, I don't know if you have or have not, but maybe never considered. But as we look out ahead, we're going to be finishing chapter 6 today and on Friday, and then we're going to be taking a break for the awesome opportunity to reflect and teach and glean continuously as we do every year for Easter, for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And so in, in lieu of that, we have opportunities from which now to end a continuous flow of the message of maturity that we saw in Hebrews chapter 5 and how that's going to be affecting us and how he writes about that in Hebrews chapter 6. But what's interesting about Hebrews is it's the only book in the New Testament that mentions Melchizedek, N like, like there is no other. And yet in the Old Testament, there's only references to Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14, 18 to 20, and also Psalm 110. Psalm 110 references Christ coming in the order of Melchizedek, and yet you have in Genesis, where out of nowhere you see Melchizedek mentioned. The more interesting point of, of fact, just of observation, is you think it's coincidence that Melchizedek is only written in the book of Hebrews, a book dealing with again, higher level mature people and talking about and discussing the order of things from which Christ will fulfill in the coming days ahead and not to mention of all the flow of thought or we call chapters 
and the books of he- in the book of Hebrews, uh, or to the Hebrews, the book is called. It's he's only mentioned in chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven. Right? Like that's it. So it's rather interesting that he's building up a crescendo of chapter five and six to more so kind of delve into the outline of, of who Christ is, not in the depth of, of teaching, because he already mentioned he's not going to do that because of what he mentioned in chapter 5, but he gives him an outline sketch. But he doesn't give him an outline sketch in chapter 7 until he addresses the issues of their behavior and where they are and their faith and where they should be and the dangers they're in. And so that's, th- that, that's interesting to me that the maturity issue, chapter 5, chapter 6, is sandwiched in between the presentation of Christ as Melchizedek being, being brought forth to the, to the table. So there's something to understanding, whether you like it or not, there's something to understanding the future reality of how Christ is continuously being understood and known and his functionality unto us, present and future. There's some depth there that he clearly says is not able to be taught or understood because of the lack of mental spiritual preparations because of the lack of behaviors that have caused us to be lacking in the, bi- in the ability to bear or to understand that teaching. So for folks who want to say, oh, Bible's easy to understand, it's easy to see, uh, how, how do you get that out of what I just said, which is what the book of Hebrews has been saying. These three chapters, five, six, and seven, six is in the middle of this sandwich, it's, it's rather interesting, um, again, that <laughs> the, all these things flow. So to remind you once again where we're at, chapter 6 is loaded with stuff. I erased the board because i got to write some stuff on there. It's going to be quite a bit of stuff. But I can tell you this, it is a, a loaded. And every time I read it, it seems like I've read it many, many times. And every time I read it and study it, I, I get different layered insights. It's, it's just continuously, like, you know, really wow to me. Um, and now is the most, to me, uh, exacting because of how I've always mentioned, somebody asked me the other day at, at work, and I was mentioning how it's always better to, it's I always learn, I think I mentioned this before to you guys, uh, for me, I can't speak to anyone else, but how God has used me is that when he has put, okay, this chapter, this verse, this whatever, to go look at it, I'll, I'll dig into it and I'll see something. But if I actually go through the entire book and the flow of thought, and then I take the verses and the word. I always gain a depth that is just way more profound than any other way of study, going from point A all the way through. But that takes so much time and so hard. So if someone says, hey, explain this verse in the middle of a, of a book, of a chapter, of a, I mean, I, y- you can get a good assessment, but you're going to miss some depth of peripheral that's not there because you didn't go through the whole fluidness of the depth building on block upon block, precept upon precept, and then, and that's what's happening and happened in other studies, which I also think is interesting. The two things that earmark, uh, before I go into our uh, reprisal of the book of Hebrews, two things that are earmarked in God's sovereign coincidence. I don't think so. He has guided us through the book of Acts, coincidentally, which is crucial to understand what's going on in the book of Hebrews because it talks about the dynamics of how things were forged in the early congregation. And then also, he, he mentions to us already from shortly, no more, no more than a few years ago, he's shown us the suffixes and words in Greek that reflect to us plurals that never I never really focused in on and, and, and never really kind of, uh, to my own fault, never really saw and always makes me encouraged to one be implored to say, hey, you know, son, there's more things to be learning here from my Father in heaven and our, our God. And at the same time, it's okay, you know, it just, it just excites you to know there's how much more of the things in our sinful flesh, not intentionally, we, we miss, that he continuously wants to show us. But there's a reason why he did it and there's time that he did it. So I think seeing the, the languages for what they are, seeing uh, the book of Acts and its, and its dynamics of reflecting back from years ago study amongst other books as well, it all builds on pre- preparatory um, cultivation of the soil, of the mind, of the heart, of the spirit, from which to receive now the message differently which is why the old adage, you can always read God's word and always come away with something better and fresher and newer every time. And that is why. Not just your experiences in life add to the flavor of your perspective, but your experiences in God's word and with him, s- and him understanding more about him changes the dynamics of that. And so unfortunately, people rely more on the first, the experiences to change their perspectives instead of relying more on their experiences with God, not just in life, but with God and his word to change their perspective. 
and that's the, the bigger issue there. So the, the avenue from which we look at now in the book of Hebrews to, to go back and, and, and revisit again is to remember that chapter one is, is so important to remember that it's emphasizing Christ, right? Well, chapter five began to do that, took a dovetail away. Chapter six is gonna explain more of the problematic issues. And then chapter seven is gonna get more into Christ again and the order of the Melchizedek. But that theme of, let me tell you who Christ is, let me tell you his majestic, superior excellence above all else, and why it's so important to understand who he is and what he has done, because you'll realize what's at stake is gaining more of him, and maybe when you realize how grand the high prize of the calling is, you might therefore consider changing your behaviors. You might therefore consider that, it, that there is a lot at stake. It isn't just about being saved by grace through faith, hallelujah, and going to heaven and then realizing that, what? I missed out on extra measures of love and extra measures of abounding blessings of God? And he's gonna say, yes. Well, how did that happen? He said, boy, look yourself in the mirror. How did it happen? I told you and I told you and I told you. He would say, not me, he would say that to you. Like, I, I don't know what you're gonna, how, you don't blame him. That, that's on you and me. That's on you and me. We have to collaborate to, to desire more of that, you know? And so chapter one's all about that, setting a stage. And chapter two and three gets into that behavioral issues, how we got to adjust. And again, I mentioned on Friday, it is, he doesn't give warnings because of what's gonna happen. He gave warnings because of what already is or has happened. They've already adopted behaviors that are not conducive to mature people. They've already adopted behaviors, already being enlightened ones, already being mature ones of a 30 fruit yield. He, they've already adopted behaviors that are destructive, that are prohibitive of them to learn, that are handcuffing them as obstacles to see things better and more and comfort and encouragement in God and his word. They're not facing what could be, they're facing what is. And he's addressing it head on in chapters two and three, which many in our churchianity friends would say, oh, it's about people that are kind of in their heart and this and that, remember we talked about that? And this is why anybody who teaches the book of Hebrews who doesn't understand it's written to all the people of God and has, it has no reflection at all, no intent at all of talking to anybody who's not in Christ. That's not the book at all's intention. He's talking to people that are mature ones, not just folks in Christ, mature ones in Christ. And, and if you don't understand that, nor do you want to act, uh, uh, you know, agree with that, then that, that's, your, that's your decision. But know this, you will always continuously miss the understanding. You will never see the insights of what he's intending you to see. However, much like my lawn mower incident I told you about, it took many weeks into taking apart the lawnmower and putting it back together again before I realized lawnmowers have a lot of similarities until all of a sudden the intricate details of the actual manufacturing, in my case, Toro the lawn boy, caused the demarcation of, it's time to put up or shut up now. I gotta either take the F in the class that I'm not gonna get this right, or I gotta go back again and be behind and catch up on redoing everything with the right manufacturing process in play. Because all motors have a clut, have a carburetor, have a choke. Lawn mowers back in the day, I don't know if they have it now, back in the day, right? So the reality is that a lot of cars are made the same, principally speaking. Does that mean that you can use any manual to fix your car? Just any manual of an SUV, just any one of a sedan? No, but can you use the similitude of principles and gain insights to how to fix, fix any kind of a car just on the basics of how a car works? Sure, but that's what Hebrews is talking about. You cannot use this, this malarkey of, of, of just generalizations and, and approach this book and say, oh, it means this and this and that, and you're not respecting the fact it's specifically written, not just to those in Christ and the vehicle of the one new man, but they're in a specific model class. It's called the mature ones. So if they say, what's your year make and model of your car? Well, the year is, my year of my car is, uh, it's, it's she's just a 2BC, that's the year of my car. <laughs> Oh, the make, I'm in Christ, I'm the one new man. The model, I'm the mature, I'm the, uh, I'm the mature one model. Well, what, what version do you have of that? Is it the one with the leather interior, is it the one with the hybrid fuel? Look, man, that's between God and, 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 and me maybe not knowing that, but I know one thing, I know what, I, I know what kind of car I'm in. I know, I know I'm, in that, I'm, I'm in that model. I'm in the make of, of in, I'm in Christ. I'm, one, I'm the one new man, as you are you, and we're in a model the model that we have 
the make and model. The model we have is the mature one model, okay? And that's, that's the vehicle we're in. We're in the Sosoma, the joint body. So we gotta figure out, that's who it's written to. Now again, you can, you can, you can reject that, you can not believe that, I, I really don't care. I, I just don't, I'm not gonna argue about it. But the reality is that, <laughs> understand the reason why, if that strikes people with a hard, like, oh my gosh, that sounds kinda harsh, that sounds exclusive or, or sounds, uh, you know, exclusionary. No, no, it's just, it's just the truth of it, man. I, I, did, did Jesus talk to all of Israel the same way he did to the 12 apostles? No, did he, did he take the three, Peter, James, and John, differently from the other 12? Yes, how about the other 70 appointed in Luke 10? Did you hear about them again? No, does that mean Jesus hates those people? No, come on, relax. He loved them all, but there was different levels of intimacy and of understanding and conversations. He pulled people aside. Just gather the facts. Just gather the facts and ascertain in your mind, okay, that makes sense. No, I, I get it. Factual data, regardless of denomination, dictates Jesus behaved in a way that is in similitude to how the book is written. The living word, God the Son, behaved in a way that the written word behaves in similitude. It speaks to different audiences differently because of the proximity to him. It's not hard to understand. It's just hard to believe and accept based on what church sanity has sold us down the river on for many, many years and what your mindset has been. And I'm asking you to forget that mindset and believe in God and his word. And you have to see it for what it is. We've already built the precipice of, of principles of Susie on that foundation that I just mentioned. So chapter two and three, the behavioral trait that they were lacking and they, he's warning them what's gonna happen instead. Then he goes into chapter four and he mentions the entrance into rest and the rest. We talked about rest from works uh, on behalf of someone else to, to, to do those works of the fruits of the Spirit versus the rest from, meaning the rest, meaning to dwell. The, the rest from sin, the rest from actually the, the, encumbrance, the, the encumbrance of always having to put off, repent, confess, all that. You finally get to work, stop that work. But you still have other work to do now. Now there's other work to do to ongoingly bear the, the extra fruit yields you need. But yet the other aspect of when he says the rest, that's referring to a dwelling. One's a ceasing from a laborious work. The other one is a ceasing, not from laborious work, but a way of resting in a dwelling and an ongoing, what he calls a katadomio, because there's the domio, which is a dwelling, and katadomio means a permanent dwelling. And a way to understand that is, in, in human practical terms, to remember, so rest would be com commensurate with when you're traveling, you rest in a hotel, you rest at a neighbor's house, you rest at a friend, a family's house, right? You rest but you take the rest back in where you domicile, where your driver's license, where your taxes are filed, as the, as the government knows, what is your legal address? That's the way of saying, what's your catadomio? I don't care what you domioed on vacation or what you domioed overseas or what you domio with your family and friends. You will dwell, you will rest from your work of homework, of, of your housework and other places. But you will always go back to the rest, the catadomio, your permanent dwelling. So again, the rest speaks to a permanent dwelling, your katadomio. Rest speaks to domio, a temporary dwelling of some benefits, but not fully. And so that's what's mentioned in chapter four. And with that, he mentions two different kinds of belief that has to be present. The ongoing belief in having the constant reminder that you have to ongoingly believe in God and his word. And then secondly, you have to ongoingly become, be stay teachable and flexible. Those are the two word to use from belief you remember in chapter four. So then he goes into chapter five, he talks about Christ being our, being our high priest, but at the end of chapter four, did he get graphic or what? About the experience that God's word brings in our life. Boy, he wasn't playing. Talking about pulling your head back, cutting the, the, the death blow, and ex 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 you know, exacting out of us the sin and flesh, and uh, as a loving, compassionate physician who's doing the spiritual healing, as it's a painful process. He's holding on to us, he wants us to grip onto him, and because of that process, and knowing the benefits of that process and who's doing that process, we can negate, hey, we know how it makes us feel so, so gut-wrenching and so, so piercing to our soul. We can, we can relegate all that under the subjection of the fact that who's doing the operation and what his intent is, and that's the reason why he ends chapter four by saying, now we can approach boldly, with boldly ongoing boldly with confidence, the throne of grace. Knowing who's in charge and, and through that painful, arduous, exacting surgery of ripping out our sin and flesh and our bitterness and our hatreds and our indifferences and our shortcomings and all that stuff. He, he says it, you, know, you can approach with boldness now knowing that it, I know that all about you. That's why I need to have daily surgery 
And that's why the surgery is very hurtful and painful for you. Are we on the same page? Yes, Father, I am on the same page. I, I, I get it. Are you, were you, will, were you willing to lay down in the chair, let me strap you in, and let's go in the next opera? Every day there's an operation. There's a major surgery every day he's doing, or he wants to do, as long as we collaborate, sit down and, and spend time with him. And, and so we talked about how the net result of that in chapter four was he was talking about that's how you're able to enter into rest and the rest is by being subjected to that ongoing process every single day, like the manna. You don't, you don't have it for, you don't have an intense, you know, what do they call it? Revival. They call it revival. That's their way of saying, we've not done that process. We've short-circuited it for so many years. We're gonna draw in people and money and, and, and numbers because we're now doing what God told us to do all along. What? That's what they're doing. I'm just being honest with you. And even, that's what their intent is, but even the crazy part is that they're not doing it. That they're not, they're not teaching that principle, what I just said. It's all about sensationalism when they do revival for the most part that I've seen. It's either sensationalism or it's about a basic message of salvation by grace through faith to an already saved Christian people. That's not the point, is it? So anyway, so with that being said, chapter five then builds on the, the maturity issue uh, and at the end of the chapter, because he's talk, he talks about Christ and who Christ is in comparison to the Aaronic priesthood. And he's comparing that because he's really showing the superiority of Christ and how he has provided and what he has given and who he is greater than the house of Moses that he already mentioned earlier in the previous chapters, that his house is greater his work is greater, his priesthood is greater because he is God Almighty. And so it's really uh, details he's getting into. People say, oh, he's God Almighty, he's our high priest, and there's no priest higher. Well, uh, we know that, right? But then he goes into, he wants to go into details. He's like, I can't do it. As we now go back to our flow of thought from chapter five, chapter six, and verse five, five chapter five, verse 11, he said, well, I can't do it concerning the, the okay, in verse 10, uh, well, excuse me, verse 8, 9, and 10. He learned obedience. Again, that means he, he, <laughs> he came to this point through experiences in a body of a man and flesh and blood and bone of s through suffering. Again, he didn't have to, but he did it to subject himself to say he's earned the right for airship to show and, and speak to you and me's concerns or questions of how would you know you're in your ivory tower? How would you know you're so different and separate and holy from us? And he said, okay, tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come down and I don't have to, but I do it because I love you. I'm gonna go down to your level and I'm gonna show you how it's done, okay? And they sin, sick, depraved, disgusting, selfish, egotistical, arrogant, bitter, angry, hateful world, filled with evil. I'm gonna walk through it unscathed, internally, externally, you name it, and on the other side, be like, we're good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty profound. Th th I mean, you don't have to do that, but wow. Okay, thanks for um, making that clear, that, that we have a, a savior, a God, a, a creator who, who, who chose to come down to our level and, and to be subjected to such a thing as, as if to say, yeah, I learned, uh, be, I subjected myself and, and I, 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 I was through the process of obedience in a confound body of flesh and bone. That was the first time that he was in that reality. And so he's saying in that process. And in verse nine, he was the author of our salvations of the Aeonian. And then he talks about how he was being declared a high priest after Melchizedek in verse 10. In verse 11, there's many things to say, but they're a difficult interpretation, remember? Then he mentioned how the reason why he couldn't to talk more about what Christ has done for us and what he's doing for us. Because remember, that is the warning's import. The warning is don't be sluggish. But the question is, why? Well, because you'll misunderstand and not know the advanced benefits and duties and realities of who Christ is and what he's doing for you now and in the future and what's at stake, that, that, that that's why? Nah, that's okay. Because once I'm saved, I'm saved, and by grace through faith, and, and no, not of works, no one should boast, and, and I'm an heir, and I am redeemed, and I'm an overcomer. I'm good to go, baby. Okay, if you think that way, then, then you read the book of Hebrews and ask yourself the question, the writer must be completely on some kind of drugs because he's writing in a way that does not seem to speak to that certainty that you can just 
be in Christ and it's all good. It, it doesn't seem to say that to me, like at all. It doesn't even come close to that, which is why it was a book that was later on included in the scripture, right? Just like James and Jude and 1st, 2nd Peter and Revelation, right? They, they, they were confuted. They, they were disputed. They were confusing the issues of salvation and inheritance. The provisions of in, in faith by grace through faith and the sense of difference of accountability once you're in Christ. They didn't understand the distinct distinctions. So in chapter 5, he ends with this issue about being sluggish. And because you're being sluggish, there was needs for us, he says, to be those kind of teachers. The word he uses is didactoi, meaning those kind of teachers who teach mysteries and kingdoms. And instead of being able to do that, he says, you're in need of being taught yourself, but not the mysteries and the secrets, oh, nay, nay, to being taught the distinctive natures of how to understand the previous elements of the arcade, the beginnings of the Old Testament, basically, and then of the frameworks of God's divine word, which we talked about on Friday. Understanding how people see the general understanding of how Christianity has evolved into a church sanity view of saved and lost only. And it's up to us to, to incorporate and help people meet them where they're at and say, no, no, I, I get what you're saying, but that's not really accurate. What's accurate is that there's the ignorance of people that don't know who God is at all of the Bible. Then there's people of covenant, right? As we said, I'll do this by memory. Then there's people in testament. And the people in testament have growth cycles that, that they experience different inheritances and salvations. What? Well, yeah. The Bible speaks to it. Let me show you some of these words. That's the difference. And then we talked about how people see God and his word differently. They start with a premise of who God is on a lower level, but don't add to the other, the other tier of who God is. Same with God's word. They take it as a generalization. And we mentioned that. I need to build on that. And this is what chapter 5 is, is ending with and how he segues into chapter 6 because he says in chapter 6, at the end of chapter 5, he mentions, first of all, he says, if you are on a steady diet of galactose milk, because the two galactose milk, chapter 12 is about the galactose milk of sporos, and then chapter thir and cha verse 13 is about the galactose milk of, of the sperma. And so either way, he's saying, look, if you're at the beginning levels of sporos or sperma, there's a distinctive difference there. If you're at the beginning levels of sporos, you can hear strong meat. You can hear it. You can't have a steady diet of it. Not even close. Not even close. That's what he says in verse 12. You cannot have a steady diet of hearing it. At least an epios can steadily be hearing it, and doesn't mean that they'll acclimate to it and digest it. But every now and then, a person in the sporos will hear. And we've, we've seen it happen. People in the sporos will hear about the mysteries and secrets, and they'll just go, they'll, someone will be excited, someone will go look at it like it's weird, and then they'll just discount it, right? But they do a study, they can't, they, they will not and cannot be hearing a study diet of that. It's just not something they will be able to take. And that's a physical imagery of how people that are so malnourished, they can't take solid food, they can't do that, right? So then he looks into verse 13 and said, they're unskilled, the people of Nepios of Galactos, they're unskilled, meaning you have no experience in, 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 in growing in, in this faith that has been sown to you. You're, you're, you're like the person who was shown the seed on rocky ground. The, the sun scorched you, the, the pressure, the heat, no, you, no, you, you can't do it. And so you're unskilled, you're inexperienced, you have not even a, nothing even grew. You're unskilled at all, which is what an APO says, he doesn't grow at all. He doesn't even get sanctified or reconciled to, to, uh, to, to the sperma. So that person has no skill, no, no experience, nothing, zero. And he's like, that's what you guys have turned into. What? So these these mature ones have, have, have backslidden, have, have resorted back to a mentality and to a lifestyle, to a behavior that is pretty damning because they went, back, they went from being naniscos, young mature people, technon, micros, no, technon, pation, micros, now nepios. They, they went down, they went from being mature ones to a knock below that, children of a heavenly promise, to a knock below that, reconciled, to a knock below that, mikros, to a knock below that, nepios. What? What? They're acting like that. They're not down there. They're still mature ones, but their behaviors, their behaviors, their mindsets are acting like a people who is unskilled. And because they are acting that way, guess what? They have become 
unskilled. And this is what's interesting. People say, I don't understand. They've always had a, I myself have always had a confounding problem with this. How can somebody be written to, mature ones, in chapter 5, verse 13, about the segue in chapter 6, how can they be a mature one and yet be called unskilled? Why would he call them Nepios, infants, of Galactos? Huh? What? Huh? What? Well, it's really not hard to understand when you understand what's going on. Think of the intellectual or physical demands of a profession that requires your utmost focus and attention. I'll use the medical. Utmost intellectual demands are, are made of understanding what you have to do to, pr do to proceed with any kind of procedure, uh, especially when it's on your loved one, right? That's the difference between major surgery and minor surgery. It's major surgery when it's on someone you love, right? So all of a sudden, you don't want some guy graduated from med school or some gal. You want the person who's been doing it for a long time has a high success rate, right? Because they're proficient at it. And they how do they, they get proficient at it? From their knowledge and from their experience and collectively getting to the end results. That's, that's how you do it, right? Knowledge, experience, both have taught them. So let's just say they left the medical field and practiced law for six years. Then they came back to do your surgery. Would you be comfortable with that? No, I, I wouldn't. Not at all. I don't care how good you were before, Jack. Um, no, no, you're the neurosurgeon, the highest rated in the country. How come you had no surgeries done in the last five years? Oh, I was on a sabbatical. W where? I was, um, I was uh, playing baseball. I was trying out my, that's my love, to be a baseball player. W what? I was practicing law. Well, then you lost some of the, your knowledge wasn't practically being used every day for five years, and your experiences also are not gonna be freshly in your mind. You're still gonna have some higher, higher proficiencies versus the others but you're gonna lose some of your sharpness, aren't you? Right? And that is what he's talking about. Over in the athletic world, it's when somebody gets out of shape. When they're in shape and they, and they just, they, they retire, and all of a sudden they end up, a couple years later, they look nothing like what they did before, right? So you can't slack off, if you will. When you are at a level of maturity, and you back off or take a sabbatical or take your focus off the ball, that's how your behaviors and mindset can be looked at and viewed as nepios. People always get confused, but that means they're nepios all along. No, 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 no. Because God says, no, D does your degree go away as a neurosurgeon when you go to play baseball in Dominican Republic because you want to live out your dream? No. This means you're not staying sharp within the degree that you've already obtained. God's already put you to this level. You don't lose it. That's how he sees you, accountable, period. Even though you live, he goes, okay, you can do what you want, but don't act like you don't think I'm going to hold you accountable to what I brought you to. It doesn't work that way. He didn't give you the pedigree because it's not you that graduated with that intellect and experience. He gave you the mindset. He gave you the understanding. He gave you the wisdom. He gave you the experience. How dare you forego it, reject it, and go back and ignore it, take it for granted, and then get lazy about it and say, well, he doesn't see me as that no more. He, well, maybe you don't see yourself that way, and others don't see yourself that way, but don't deceive yourself, because the university dean who issued your diploma, God Almighty, he knows what you graduated with. He issued your diploma. Nice try, buddy. He knows exactly where you are and what you're supposed to be doing. He does not appreciate it. Not at all. Not from me and not from you. And that's what Hebrews is talking about in chapter 5. You're not living up to the degree of what your level of intellect and experience of understanding of God and His Word has brought you to. You're living as if you're forsaking it. And you're living in behaviors that are not conducive to that sharpness and keeping yourself sharp. Yes? I would say the good analogies. So this is what he's talking about. So he's talking about these types of things that, that you don't lose your degree of what, you, what God has, has given you. Because remember, you didn't just accomplish that degree. God issued it. God sustained you with understanding. God sustained you with the experience. And then God gave you the degree. And you've exercised that degree for a while and go, you know, I'm good. I'm just, I'm just so, I'm so tired of this, man. I want to do something else. God goes, okay, fine. But don't act like I don't see you that way. I will always, God says, see you with the level of the degree of intellect and experience I gave you with me and my word, period. And you are accountable to that. And he's reminding them that in the book of Hebrews. And they're going, what? You like, think this is playtime? You think this is funny? It's not funny. Okay, listen, he goes, hey, guys, just 
hey guys, um, you guys are Jews, right? Right, you were Jews that came to be now the one new man? They're like, he's like, yeah. Remember back in the day when there was many countries, there was more countries that weren't Jewish than were Jewish. And therefore, there was more humans that were not Jewish than were Jewish, right? Well, yeah, what's your point? The point is, did not God take a minority of people comparatively from the human population and bless them with blessings as he did through Father Abram that were known to be the nation or country or people of Israel that were collectively a smaller number than the totality of humanity? What's your point? Okay, the point is, how did God take it then when we as a people live like a horse's patoot given what he just privileged us with as a people? Did he take well to that, that back then? No. What makes you think he'll take well to that now? When people in Christ are not everybody's been given the degree of intellect and, and, and experience and understanding and insight you've been given. What makes you think he's going to be okay with that? that? That you just, yeah, do it a throwaway. You just, hey, that's a throw, that's a mulligan. What? He's like, are you crazy? Are you insane? Are you insane? And not just, I mean, you put in the mix, the principle, and you put in the mix the dynamic of what he did to give Abraham a covenant and a testament in animal's blood versus over in, on the in Christ people, he gave us a new testament uh, uh, in his own blood. The levels and stakes are off the chart. And you're going to act like the same horses patoot our forefathers did? And you think God's okay with that. You are out your mind. Come on, man. Come on. How did he, how did he hold the kings and priests and prophets accountable? How did he hold all of his people accountable? Did he not care more about how they acted than he did the rest of the world? Yes. Weren't they held to a higher level of standard? Yes. What say you that are in Christ, that are part of the one new man, that have been given within that group, you're part of a smaller group, Compared to those of Israel, amongst all humanity, there was a few. Amongst those in Christ, there are a few who've been given these privileges of wisdom and insight, mysteries and secrets, and we treat it how? And we view it in what way? And that is what he's talking about. And he said, I don't really want to care about that. Now, it's, not, it's, just, it's just too much, man. It's like reading an IRS textbook of laws and, and, and tax codes. Brother Greg understands. I can put you to sleep at night. The old, the old joke, don't hold any sharp objects reading that tax code because you'll fall asleep. You might hurt yourself, right? It is thick, and they add new ones every year, right? Or throughout the year, as Greg would say. All right, so the reality is it's intense. It's, that's why you have somebody like him. Well, we have somebody like that in the textbook of God's divine, ordained wisdom of secrets and mysteries. It's so deep and so detailed. We have him as our teacher and our counselor to help us. But he just wants to know, but do you want to learn? But do you want to know? And we go, nah, and he goes, but here's the problem though. Regular people like me and you don't have to learn about our tax codes to the depth of a CPA. Well, they would have to learn it because that's, that's what their job is. You know, the accountants, that's their job. Well, guess what our job is? As people given the stewardship of the mysteries and secrets, it's our job to take someone, to take into account the spiritual form not our 1040, but, our, but our, our soul and spirit and body and measure it up against this book. Like Hebrews chapter 4 was talking about. We, we got, you, you, we're, we're the accountants. We're the ones he gave in charge. He gave Israel all in charge of the secret oracles of God, as Romans is talking about. But now he gives us, as Corinthians talks about, Colossians talks about, Ephesians talks about, the stewardship of mysteries and secrets. And that's a heavy thing. Galatians talks about it. We have stewardships of this heavier responsibility of wisdom and insight. What are we doing with it? So in verse, don't be unskilled. Don't be inexperienced. We already have the experience. We got to stay fine-tuning, getting better, always getting better, always getting better at our craft, if you will, at our, at our trade, at our task that God has given us to be spiritual, mature. Then in verse 14, as he ends chapter 5 and in chapter 6, and the reason I'm going through all this is because chapter 6 starts off with the word, Therefore, and you have to know why it's therefore, right? So, and I'm, I'm telling you why it's therefore. <laughs> so in verse 14, but the solid food for adults, for those possessing faculties habitually exercised to discrimination, both of good and evil, we mentioned how they have a heightened discernment. They can ascertain the internal character or disposition of a kakos or a kalos. 
So we talked about this and how referencing the interesting fact of these adult people have a heightened level of basically insight. They, one of the ear, ear markers, how do I know if I'm, as a mature one, you know, sliding down and, and not keeping myself sharp? The best way, here's the thing. Would you ever take a specialist neurosurgeon, for example, I keep saying those kind of people because they're, they're unique, right? You take a, a heart surgeon, right, cardiovascular surgeon, the best in, in his or her field, would you ever take that person's proficiency as being rated number one in their field across the, the world and then expect them to go into a surgical room and go, what's that? Do, would you ever expect them to do that? Uh, n probably not. Not if all, no, let me rephrase. If all the tools were the, were the basic tools of the trade and other tools were there that were proficient for cardiovascular surgeries, if that's all he was referring to, would you ever expect this surgeon to ever go, what's that? Uh, that would never happen, right? Like never. That would never happen, ever. If they're rated number one, <laughs> there's no way they walk in the room and go, scalpel, what's that? Um, what the what's that? that? Yeah, right, that would never happen. So the reality is, he's saying the discernment is that you are easily not just ascertaining the tools, but how the tools are used. So a regular surgeon might say that tool is used for this, this, and that. Whereas the high-end level, high level cardiovascular surgeon might go, well, you might use this for that, this, and this, but I can use that for also these two other things when I use it in combination with this and then do it this way and that way, and that's why I do this because people don't want to take the trip. What, 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 what? what? <laughs> and, he, and he goes through all those other dynamics of how he or she does something that gets the job done in a way that most, most people don't want to take, don't take the risk or have the knowledge from which to understand how to use the tools together to get to an end result of healing the issue, right? And so that's what he's talking about when he says heightened discernment, the ability to understand the tools, recognize them like this, like clockwork, recognize the tools. What are the tools? We talked about it on, on Friday. The tools are the basics of understanding. Understand the tools. Ignorance of God, of covenant, in testament, growth cycles, inheritances, and salvations. How to see God, who he is, how to see his word and what it is. Know the tools, know the resources, so that then you can use those tools and resources in ways that are dynamically, uniquely different because of your skill set, because of your experiences, because of your knowledge, because of the honing of your craft that God has given you. That is what makes a mature one a mature one at, at, at the highest level. A mature one is a person who has been given the tools and resources. The highest level of mature one is one who's given the tools and resources and become very proficient at it. And has become so proficient at it, they can just recognize the tools and resources like with no, they can, all mature ones recognize them, but some might hesitate for a second and go, is that a, okay, got it. Okay, got it. But the, the, but the highest mature one, the adult, the, the, the teleos as he mentions here, this word for adult, as you see on the left side of your margin, as he says, perfect ones, Teleons ones, he's referring to the people again that have the completion of the maturity come into play. They have the, not just the Dionia, but the Sunemi. Not just Teleosis, but Teleotis. They have the fullness of their maturity where they recognize the resources and tools, but at a higher proficient level, they recognize them quickly and they can ascertain quickly how, to, how they work together. But all mature ones recognize the tools and resources. Some take a little longer to maybe name them off or maybe recognize them, but they do recognize them and they do know them and some maybe work together with them, but they take a little longer to make sure they're not as proficient. But those are all mature ones. But the person here he's talking about is the person who has this level of maturity that's not just Dionea, but Sunimi, not just Teleosis, but Teleotis. They're not just recognizing the tools and resources, but the proficiency of use and effectiveness of results is tremendous. That's what he's talking about. And that's what he says, he ends with basically saying, without saying it, in the white space between chapter five and six, isn't that what you want to be? Because remember, it's like he's in, it's like he walks into a, <laughs> to a medical uh, surgical room and the scenes what I just told you, and he then starts to show the immediacy of knowing these tools and resources, and he starts to go into this specific surgeries, performancing of things, and they're just amazed. And some of them are kind of going, I kind of remember learning that in class. And some are going, I remember, I, I think I remember seeing him do that before. And some are going, what, what did he just do? And all he turns and says, isn't that what, what y'all want to, that's why, that's why you're here. Isn't that what you 
you remember, remember that's why God brought you here? For this level of intellect and experience of who he is in his word? Remember? To be like that? Isn't that what you want? And they're like, yeah. He's like, well, then, therefore, <laughs> chapter 6, therefore, <laughs> therefore, verse 6, in order to, by the way, the surgeon is not him, the writer of Hebrews. He's pointing out the, the author himself, as in God Almighty, Jesus, Yeshua, Melchizedek, order of priesthood. Therefore, leaving the first principles, leaving the RK. Now, but this time it's not the RK of the elements. So before he said in verse 12 that it was the RK of, it was the, it was the Stochia of the RK of the oracles, the Logion. So it was the foundational elements <laughs> that you were in chapter 5, verse 12, that were being left that were from the RK beginning, Old Testament, of the Logion, the divine word of God. Where here he says, therefore, leaving, which by the way, the word means to send away. Send away. Interesting. In other words, stop having conversations. Stop having depths of debates. Stop camping out and making this your definitions of what makes you you. You're better than that. Imagine, a, again, a proficient cardiovascular surgeon who wants to continuously point out, I'm not a medical surgeon, I should have used a better analogy, but whatever the tool is that they would use around the heart, say there's a special tool they use around the heart for cardiovascular open heart surgery. I, I don't know. Let's say there's one they use that other surgeries don't use, but specific to the heart, there's one particular tool that they would use, right? Well, let's just say all heart surgeons, all cardiovascular surgeons who work on the heart know this tool. But because he's the best of his class, he keeps on mentioning that tool. That, and, and, and we all know this as cardiovascular surgeons. Why do you keep saying, we, we got it? We don't want to keep hearing about what the, the, the tool's uniqueness. We need to hear about it, how you are using that tool's uniqueness to become so proficient become so much in demand, become so good at affecting a result that helps people to save lives. That's what we want to know. We, 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 we understand a tool exists. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. Stop trying to emphasize that which in our cardiovascular realm makes us uniquely different than the rest of the, of, of the doctors and physicians and so forth. I got it. But that arrogance and, and, and that type of pompous pumping their chest out to keep on mentioning your differences or your uniqueness, it, it's stop. We got it. I got it. That's what he's basically saying to you in the book. I got it. God's made us unique. Got it. Understand it. Appreciate it. Be grateful for it. But stop camping out and continuously regurgitating, you know, the same old foundational lower shelf elements that were supposed to be building blocks to greater things. So it's like a person goes, look, I got accepted to Harvard. Great. And what did you do with it? Well, I was drunk every other day, and I got a D. Well, then what's it matter if you went to heart? What's it matter? What's it matter? Exactly. What'd you do with it? Stop putting in my face your acceptance letter. What did you do with it? <laughs> you know? That's what he's basically So he goes, look, would you send away? In other words, would you forget the fact that God has privileged you is the important thing, and so focus on, because he's privileged you, Appreciating the process, what he expects from you is to not stay stationary, but to progress. That's why he says, send away the beginnings, the RK of the anointed word, with left, right side of your margin, the first principles of the doctrine of the anointed, one we should progress. And the word progress there is the word fromitha, 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 which means to bear forth, which means to forge on. It, it reminds me of of the old westerns when the guy is is trying to not get shot and yet he gets shot anyways and the old john wayne clint eastwood you know and they get shot and they for and they just drag them and you know it hurts like the dickens now it's just an acting show right but you know in real life you got shot in the leg eh? that's not fun right it's gonna hurt and then or you get shot in the chest or whatever and they're just they're just they're just putting forth every strength they have to go into safe haven behind some rock or on the horse or wherever the whole attitude of forging on means through all the difficulties in life, through all the challenges you had spiritually and mentally and emotionally and financially and physically, whatever it is, he's saying, forge on. Suck it up, man. 
God wants you to suck it up. He wants you to, to really dig deep and press forward. Now, he knows that it's never going to be easy in life. He knows that. He's not ignorant. God knows that there are ups and there are downs. There are mountains and there are valleys. He knows sometimes valleys last longer. Many people have more valley experiences than they do mountaintop experiences and vice versa. But we all experiences, we all have experiences that have similitudes of both of those, different degrees, different magnitudes, different levels of, of time frames. But he's saying, through it all, would you please allow me to be the strength, the motivation, the core of your, of your desire to move forward? Please. Stop trying to define yourself and compare yourself to other people or other things or your own self who you used to be. Stop it. Press on for me, for Christ, for your Savior, for your Creator, for your God that loves you, the one who gave you the mystery secrets, the one who enlightened you, the one who gave you a mindset of the tools of me, the one who gave you the degree to be at this level of high proficiency. Would you please do it for him? So in chapter 6, he says, leave the first principles of, of the doctrine of the anointed one or the RK of the anointed word or Christ's word. And we should progress, again, forwards on toward maturity. Toward maturity. But he says, not again laying a foundation for reformation from works causing death and a faith in God. These are two things. He begins to list six things. There are six things he's going to tell us that we've got to get past. I'm going to write them on the board later. Let me tell you something. Um, these six things, some are kind of like you're going to go, okay, that's not, like, that's not a real, some are not like, they're not lower shelf. They're pretty, you know, unique things. <coughs> and he's talking about things that these people that remember were Jewish people now in Christ, one new man. He's writing this about less than 30 years away from the resurrection of Christ, which means it just happened. There's about a 20-year span between the events in the book of Acts beginning and ending to where he's writing these these things. And so it isn't like they're not too far removed from the stories of the book of Acts that we talked about in relevance to what has happened in the book of Acts. Why do I bring that up? Because the book of Acts is about the transition of what happened from the one man, God the Son, and through his hands and his feet and his mouth, things were done and spoken by God. And now he uses the mouthpieces and the hands and feet of the 12 apostles. And that's what the book of Luke, or excuse me, the book of Acts with Luke, the writer, opens up and says. Let me tell you what he continues to do and continue to teach in and through us, his ambassadors. And so he begins to talk about it. So it's important to understand the book of Acts and how that plays out. And we remember the first 10 years, roughly, they were in unity and tight, 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 tight. Then all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul's event came into, came into uh, to view. And then you had the deacons, and you had other divisions happen with the Hellenistic Jews. And you had other things go on where then Peter began to transition the baton over to Paul. In between there was the Barnabas and Paul interaction. The name Christian was thrown out. The Jerusalem Council was in there. And then Paul's journeys ensue. And he becomes a microcosm of seeing how our character is supposed to be forged and a person who's so hell-bent on murderous killing of people for two years, how God changed this man intellectually, in his heart, his spirit, soul, was completely re-gutted and completely changed, renovated from in and out, through and through. But people don't see that for what it is. They just kind of go over it and say, oh, it's missionary journeys about Paul in the book of Acts. It's just, no, no, no. It's the relationship story between God and man, between a sovereign, loving, ordained, holy, just, compassionate God to a murderous, rich, legalistic, highly intellectual in Jewish Hebrew scholarship and in Gentile Alexandrian library knowledge how he, how he crushed this man to nothing and built him back up to something we've never seen. That, and, and the character that's forged in the midst of all that is what he was showing us in the book of Acts, what that looks like. And so we know all this from studying the book of Acts, and now we go back to Hebrews, and he's talking about how could you expect to be like the Paul that he knows about, Barnabas, who's writing this again, if in fact you don't do that. You think Paul always, he remembered where he came from, but he didn't keep on continuing to camp out on what God had taught him. He was grateful for it, but he kept on pressing forward. He kept on building. He kept on building. Appreciation, grateful, insights, always looking back, always learning, but always moving ahead at the same time. He was always doing that. And so he says, laying down the foundation, not again 
He says six things. The six things, I'm going to tell you ahead of time what they are. The first thing he says is, you can't, again, lay again the foundation. Lay, by the word, the word lay down again means it's a kata lambanoi. Or it means, and the word oi means that their foundation. Well, what foundation? The foundation that's laid down, that's, laid, that's been laid down for them. So they have a foundation that, again, is the foundation of sporos that has led them to a growth and a building up to the sperma. Has it not? Is their foundation stopped at the sporos level? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Their foundation includes the skyscraper building that includes the other tier of growth. That's why the word, if you look up on the left side of your margin, he says, laying down, Captain Laban Noi, Oi, that foundation that's specific to them, not the foundation that stops at a sporos level, but the foundation that has a built, it's so strong, it builds up, up, up. That foundation. What? Yeah, yeah, that one. And then he goes in and he says, oh, by the way, he says, uh, yeah, the, the you should not again on this foundation, we should not again lay a foundation for reformation from works causing death. What's he talking about? He's talking about two things. He's talking about the reconciliation that we had in Sporos of the foundation, lower tier, but the higher level of, the, of, of what he's talking about is when did we have lifeless works, dead works, been brought to life through reformation or metanoia, turning to God? When did that happen? When we were born again, we were born from above onto then leading us to be born again. He's talking about the foundation of how this right here was opened up when God showed us that secret mina. You can't lay that foundation again. Why do you keep going back to that? Why do you keep going back to how God showed me how Jesus is the way? We, we know that. That's why you are who you are. God showed me that the Word of God is more detailed and more uh, awesome and, and more than just salvation by grace through faith. W we know that. That's why you are who you are. Would you stop focusing in on things that are just common nature of understanding? We get it. We know that. Let's move along, little man. Let's move along. But a no, they want to go into, this is what, that's because that's what the Jewish idioms are all about, right? They're all about saying, we're the ones who father Abraham. We're the ones in the house of Moses. We're the ones who have the law. We're the ones who have the temple. Well, enough. Enough. Jesus said, uh, excuse me, but can I not take rocks and make them into kids? <gasps> That's so disrespectful. He said, what's disrespectful? The part that you value what I made you more than he who made you that way? Or the fact that I called you out for what you are. Arrogant and ignorant. What, what, what part's offensive? Come on, man. Come on, right? So he's basically saying, stop. Be, understand. Abram didn't look for God. Not even close. God called him. And from that was the beginning of all the things we know to this day. We still then and now always refer to what came out of him as the people that were Hebraic, that became Israel, that were referred to now as Jews. All started from God on his own just saying, Abram, come here. Yeah, you, come here. Okay. The, the, what? Where, where's, where's, why be always grateful, always remembering of what your beginnings are? Absolutely. But don't continue to think defining that in your life, how uniquely awesome that is, makes it okay as a reason to justify why you're not progressing and living and serving the God that called you out differently than others. That's what he's basically talking about. Do something with what he's given to you. So then in verse 6, excuse me, verse 6, chapter 6, so the Reformation from, uh, from dead works is talking about Let's not go back again and continue to talk about turning to God and to Christ, our, 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 our Paschal Lamb, and how we're reconciled in Him through His blood, or how we turn to Christ and the secret meaning, how He gave us the understanding of the depth of the detail of His Word and brought us alive through His Word at a different level. We, we understand that. We understand in both cases, your dead works through turning to God became alive. One in the Word of God, the spoils came alive for you to be bearing fruit. I, we get it. We get it. We also get that if Christ didn't show you the secret of the, of the mina, the, the intrinsic silver value, 
that you and me, none of us could understand what we understand now. We, 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 we get it. Same team. We, we get it. But why is that something you keep on wanting to make it into something that's more than what it is? It's, but, but it's what makes us unique. We already know we're on the same team. We got the same glorious invitation. We understand. Stop being so enamored with the, with the golden ticket and ask yourself, why do you have it? What are you doing with it? Instead of saying, I'm going to worship the ticket itself. How about worshiping the one who gave it to you? How about understanding why you have it? How about understanding what it's about? Instead of just focusing on the golden ticket itself. That's what he's talking about. And he says, in faith upon God. That's number two. Faith upon God. What is that supposed to mean? Why, how is that a basic foundation to lay again? In other words, we got it. Yeshua, Jesus, God the Son is the Messiah. We have to have faith upon him, not on the law of Moses, not on the Old Testament, not on the, the circumcision. We, we know this. We know this. By grace through faith. We got it. We got it. We know this. Why is that? If that becomes the earmark of your belief system, if that becomes the earmark of your fellowship, then, oh, look, we were shown reconciliation to God in Christ. Oh, look. We were shown how the depth of God's glory comes alive. Oh, look, we become the ones who understand that Christ is God Almighty, God the Son. Those are all great things. They are great things. But, is, but the point he's making is that's not what he expects you to stop and camp out on. He wants us to take those things, appreciate those things, build on those things. Progression. Progression. Progression to get better. Some of us go, I can't even get that down right. Well, you know what? That's the problem. Therein lies the problem, what he said back in Hebrews chapter 5. Because they were dull and slacking and lazy. They were lacking even getting these things down. So in verse 2, he says, for the doctrine of immersions. Well, what is that about? You know, when they were in Matthew 28, go ye therefore and make disciples immersing them. Immersion had to do with disciples. The first immersion we see in the New Testament was John the Baptist who was immersing them. For what? For repentance for the Jews to get their hearts right as people of covenant to receive their Paschal Lamb. And for those in Christ, once they receive their Paschal Lamb, to identify with him as the one new man that they are in Christ. But the reality is that people misunderstood these immersions, and they do to this day. Our Pentecostal friends consistently misunderstand these things. And he talks about how when you are immersed into Christ, you are clothed in Christ, Galatians 3.27. So the immersion he's talking about is the immersion in John the Baptist did not clothe you in Christ. It did not make you a, a person who could follow Christ. It made you a person who was prepared. You were basically earmarked. You were doing a precursor. So the preparer of the way's job and functionality was to get us in a functionality of habits and traits to forge in us so we'd be able to then carry those. That's like study habits when you're in high school carry over to college. But the same study, the same exact way you study won't be the same way that you'll be demanded of in college, that's for sure. There's a lot of self-study involved in college. A lot more than there is in high school. There's a lot more essays and, 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 and blank pages you've got to fill in than in college than there is in high school. But the tools, the principles of studying have to be really gravitated toward you just can't turn that switch on, right? That's hard to do. It's just possible, not recommended. So John the Baptist was the one who was setting forth the principles from how to approach God, how to get ready and prepared for God Almighty. From which then when we did see him on the scene, then we had another immersion that he was doing. That was different. So he says, we're not going to talk about the immersions itself. John the Baptist versus God the Son versus in Christ versus not in Christ being of Israel. Really, you're going to make that into your thing? And from that, you're going to bring up this Pentecostal sensationalism of speaking in tongues and the rest of that malarkey stuff? You're not going to pay attention to the details of Acts 19. You're going to ignore the facts. The facts are too confusing to you that you don't want to accept them. Because in Acts, in, in Acts 19, in chapter 4 through chapter 20, chapter 19, excuse me, verse 4 through verse 20, 
don't believe me, read the book. Stop denominationalizing it and sensationalizing it, as my friends like to do, who are denominationally orientated toward Pentecostalism or sensationalism. Acts 19, chapter 19, verse 4 to 20, clearly starts off with, yes, the immersion issue, John the Baptist, the immersion, Paul lays hands, as his next, his next mention in Hebrews was about imposition of hands, which was an indicator of what? Of what? I wonder if you know what it is before you have to turn and look there. We studied the book of Acts, but in that chapter is when he first began his seminary in Tyrannus. Chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. You can't cheat and stop because it suits your sensationalism message. Stop it. Keep reading the context of what happened. And Paul is using that opportunity. God's using Paul to teach them the ongoing necess necessities to maturity, to move out of the principles of John the Baptist's framework of why he immersed you into what it means to be in Christ, to be clothed in Christ, and to understand the maturity of growing in God and his word. That was the purpose. There was no mention of him going, Jesus' name, speak in tongues. That's the purpose of the seed. No, no, stop lying. And he went on to the whole chapter, to verse 20, and he continues to talk about maturity and growing and being established in Christ. Again, I didn't write the book, but that is what he's talking about. And you say, oh, we, all, we both know that. I know we know that. But some people that don't know that are so obtusely out there with their indifferences like Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, particularly verse chapter 14, they get all confused. And they get all turned back to front with speaking in tongues and sensationalism. So the people like us began to say, we understand that. And we kind of like put, our, put our, uh, you know, our foot down or hang our coat on that, that, that nail. So it's not supposed to be a big deal for us. It's not a big deal. It's a pretty common, yeah, so, we, I, yeah, big deal. John the Baptist, the immersion, yep, understand it's different. Got it, yep, sure enough. Gave us the framework of principles to understand how to approach and uh, be prepared for God. Got it. That's it, yep, that's it. What else you got? Well, speaking of tongues, nope, 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 nope. That was about those people there. They weren't clothed in Christ because they got baptized into John. John the Baptist uh, prepared them, though. They were ready to be prepared and walked and followed for God, but they didn't hear the message of Christ, and then they heard the message of Christ, and then they got they clothed in Christ, and, and then uh, Paul laid hands on them as if to commission them, as if to appoint them, as if to call them to a high level of maturity that they were already prepared for because of John the Baptist's baptism. What else you got? Well, they had to speak in tongues and have a flame, flame of fire. No, no, they didn't. No, 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 no. There was Jews present when that happens to validate the fact that there's a sign to validate that Paul is an apostle. Tyrannus is a seminary that he basically was there for a couple months, three months, and he went on to later on, then, of course, we know, be in Ephesus later and, and teach for a couple years. So here we have the beginnings of his first seminary format in which it's the opposite, how people use it in denominationalism. They bastardize it into some sensationalism, which has nothing to do with that. And so he's talking about here in the book of Hebrews, back in chapter 6, verse 2, the doctrine of immersions and impositions of hands has to do with the preparations and the practical ways in which we approach God, our preparation to, to, to be right with God, to receive God's truth and preparedness of how we do that. That's what John the Baptist's immersion was about. And the laying on of hands was a imposition to say that now that you're, when you're in Christ, you can be appointed by Christ or by an apostle to continuously be able to be educated to a higher level as he did in Tyrannus for three months, these people in Acts chapter 19 in context, verses four to 11, on going into verse 20, you will see how he educated these people. And so he's talking about, look, we're not gonna, why, I know that you are part of that group, he was saying, Barnabas is saying to these people in the Acts, in, in Hebrews chapter six, we know that in similitude, you're those kind of people that that Lord had brought you up and he laid hands on you. He, he actually called you apart, he separated you, he called you out. He made you as part of the called out, the ecclesia. We know he made you, he didn't just call you to the heavens, he's calling you out to a special mature ones. We understand that, but stop making that your issue of what makes you so much better. That, that shouldn't be something that you just camp out on and continue to pound your chest about. Acknowledge it, accept it, be grateful for it, but let's move on. 
Let's move on. Let's send that away out of our minds. What makes us us, no, nope. what makes us us is not what God has made us. It's who it is that made us and what he expects from us because of it. And then what's at stake out ahead with him. That's what he's trying to say. That's what he continues to emphasize. And they're focused in on, look what he made us. Look what he did for us. Look what he made us. Look what he did for us. Look how unique I am. And they're like, would you stop it? Stop it. We know that you're different. We know that you're unique. We all know that. We're all the same team. Same team. We got it. We got it. But let's focus in on who it is that did that, that did that for us. Let's focus in on what's expected from us because of it. And let's focus in on understanding more about this God and what he has in store for us out ahead. C can we do that? And, and by the way, in the process of doing that, can we become better people? Can, can we do that? C can we please do that? Because this, this pounding your chest thing is getting old. We stop. Send that away. Stop it. It's not healthy. Does not, make you, does not help you grow at all. Does not help you grow. And people who learn about the kingdom things, let's face it, me included, all of us included, didn't we all do that at one point? Let's face reality. We all said, I know about salvations, uh, salvation and our inheritance being different. I know about the ten virgins. I know parables are different. I know the judgment seat is going to have different things happen. Do you know? Do you? Do you? Do you? We all did that. And he's saying, stop it. Not healthy. Not healthy. Not good. Very divisive. Not to mention very immature. But we all are immature in some way. Because if we weren't, we'd be perfect. Think about that. People say, no, I'm offended. Don't call me immature. We're all immature in some way when we're grading ourselves by the test of what God calls maturity in spirit. So we all have to mature more in spirit. And so because of that, we all have immaturities in our life we have to work through. And we have to acknowledge that in order to be able to work through that. And so he says in verse 2 again, not just the, again, the, the immersions or impositions of hands, like, but he says also of the resurrection of the dead ones. So what's he, what's he talking about there? Resurrections of different bodies, in other words. He's including that as also foundational old hat. Wow, that's pretty profound stuff. First Corinthians 15, that's not normalcy stuff. He's saying, yeah, that's, I know, I know that's pretty cool stuff that we know that most folks don't know, but don't make that your earmark of what makes you you. He even brings up the Ionian judgment. The sixth thing he brings up. And he brings up, yeah, that's pretty profound too. What well, it sure heck is, man. He's like, yeah, the bema seat, the have, the have nots, the, the recompenses, the rewards. We know about that stuff. He goes, yeah, I know. But I want you to stop camping out on those things. I want you to take those things, put them in your back pocket, understand them, know them, appreciate them, be grateful for them. But just like a child who was raised by loving, caring, giving, supportive, spiritual parents, don't keep saying that every time you're in a relationship when because of that, it's helped you to be a better person. Don't keep on saying it and saying it and saying it and saying it and saying it. Would you just live it for crying out loud? Good God, stop. Just live it. And better yet, become better because of it. Build on what they did and become even better. Oh, and then ask yourself the question, why did they do that? Did they want you to be the same as them? No, they want you to be better. But for what reason are you want to, they want you to be better? To just your, so you're better? No, so that you can be also a better, not just human being, that ends up being a better parent, a better spouse, husband or wife, right? Come on. Right? How irritating would it be if someone kept saying to you how they were blessed, how they were, would you stop, man? I got it. I got it. I got it. How about living in your blessings? The benefits of what God has given to you. How about, how about actually embracing those blessings, not just keep on saying them intellectually or camping out on them or discussing them or arguing them. How about we just leave that behind, acknowledging it, appreciating it, defining it, never forgetting it, absolutely, but let's make it so that we move on. Don't be like the Jewish people and say the law defines us, the temple defines us. Yeah, but you saw where it led to them, legalism, hardened hearts, arrogance, ignorance of the truth, and presumption upon God. That's where it led them. Is that where you want it to lead you? Because that's what's happening. That's what he's telling them. 
D guys, you got to wake up, man. This is not good stuff. He's telling the behaviors already in chapter 2. They, they, they're losing their attention. They're not focusing. They're crossing the line. They're not listening closely. They're not considering. They're not staying spirit-filled. They're not fully convicted. And now they're being dull and lazy. These are mature ones he's talking to. So when you think that I'm making this up in chapter 6, because I don't see it in the white space of my Bible, go back and read chapters 2 and 3 and 5, and you tell me uh, how this is made up. <laughs> he's telling you this because he's, he's making sure they understand. The, you guys, you're not, just any, you're not just anybody in Christ. You're the mature ones. You need to act like it. There's so much more expected of us. Do you not understand? And I don't know why this is not a warning, but it should be. This should be a warning right here in chapter 6. Say that right now. Now, the five warnings, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list it as one. The five warnings are the go vent warnings and of, are the old kingdom uh, teaching warnings. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't, I don't care what they say. This is a warning right here, Jack. Straight up warning. I don't know how you can't say it. Not, it how it's not a warning when he says in verse 4, by the way, it leaves it out. The word impossible is on the left side of your margin in verse 4. But in verse 6, it, they put it in verse 6 instead. I never caught that before, but you'll see it. Right side of the margin, the word impossible is not in verse 4, but it is in verse 6. Left side of the margin, the word impossible is in verse 4, not in verse 6. Why did they do that? Because their interpretation limitations of who they think he's talking to. They couldn't accept the truth. That mature ones are being punched in the face, basically, with, with, a, with a hard truth. I wouldn't say punched in the face. They're being hit pretty hard with a hard truth. I call it like a velvet brick. It's a hard truth given softly in love. And they're being told, look, man, this is not playtime. This is serious stuff. And you are missing out on so much. So rich. So, so much. But in verse 3, in between, I was skipped over it. He says, in these things we do, if God permit. And what things we do? Leave behind. By our own will? Nope. By my own desire? No. You mean if I just commit myself to, to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be grateful, I'm going I'm to be thankful, I'm not going to define myself and, and become arrogant or immature or in some way kind of, kind of just always enamored with what God has given me, I, I'm going to just continue to focus on Him and, and what He wants from me and how I can be improve on being a better person and see what's out ahead and, and what that means about Him and His Word and me. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to choose to do that. Hebrews 6, 3 goes, no, no you're not. That's good that you want to do that, but you're only going to do that if God permits you to do that. Wow. Okay, so let me get this straight. So God's going to make me into a mature one, not because I earned it, deserved it, attained it. He showed me the insight through his word to get me the ability to know what I know about him and his word. Then he's going to challenge me to expose me, to show me my arrogance and my ignorance of being caught up in my immaturities, of hanging my coat on what he's given to me and what he's made me. Instead of focusing on he who did it and what he expects and extracts out of me and what he wants that to mean to my life now and later with him. But you're telling me that I have to focus on that and I have to not cross the line, listen closely to that, consider that, stay spirit-filled on that, be convicted of that, and not be dull and lazy about that. But you're saying even if I choose to acknowledge what you just said, I really can't do that unless God permits me to. Wow. Talk about sovereignty. So I don't become mature unless God makes me mature. I don't stay in a place of, mature, uh, of lower level maturity or progress in maturity unless God ordains it. What? Well, that's insane. Well, there you go. And he's like, guess what, guys? None of us know. None of us know. But you know what? Like I said the other day, I'll say it again multiple times. Having the study and having yourself in this position does not guarantee you a single blessed thing. What it does is give you the opportunity to be qualified to have a chance, to have the consideration for these higher blessings. There's no guarantee of that unless you're at that level of hunter fruit, but you don't know that until God tells you that. That's the only guarantee is that. Other than that, we don't know, man. I don't know. What wave are you going to be in? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to presume upon God. No, uh -uh, no, no, not, not this guy. No, no, no. So I, I don't know. And so here he's saying, he's saying it to us, these things we do, to press on to maturity, to forge ahead, 
to be able to be persevering to ahead and not have our immaturities and our natural human behaviors be kind of kind of a little bit proud about the fact I know about the resurrection, it's a different body, man. I know about the Bema seat. I know about it, man. How many times do you hear people say that to you? Hey, did you read my book? Hey, did you read the book? Hey, did you read this chapter? Hey, did you know God's gonna do this? Have we all not done that to people? Oh, you got, oh, you got, oh, you just got, oh, you just got. He's saying, no, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't do that. What? It's kind of exciting, right? And he's like, yeah, I know it's exciting, but why don't you focus in more on who it is that gave you that information and then presenting him because of that information in your life in a way that's compelling. What? Well, that's harder. Well, no joke it is, right? Oh, but also it doesn't mean you're accused from not knowing the material. Well, what? I got to do both? Yeah. Be the, be the straight A valedictorian student on the material, but also be a straight A valedictorian student on the application of the material because I expect both from you. I will pick up what I haven't laid down. I will reap what I have not sown. Any questions? Um, yes, um, I didn't sign on for this AP course in spiritual maturity. This seems too advanced for me. He goes, tough. Next question. What? But what? Well, I got a question. I, I want to do the extra credit, and I want to succeed, and I want to get an A. What do I have to do to get there? Um, I'll determine what your grade is. Uh, you can't um, will your way to your grade. I, I, I determine that. It's already been predetermined. Next question. What? I mean, it, it <laughs> you just, so what, I, what's my job then? To embrace the process of obedience and desire to get to know Christ and to be able to, 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 to maximize everything that he's given us and to squeeze out like the blood and the marrow all that he's given to us. And so even though he's charging mature ones, people who hear me say, oh, the book he was written only to mature ones, they, they think it's an elitist message when I say it. But do you really want to be the ones he's talking to like this? Because no, no, no offense, from a personal standpoint, I don't, I don't like it. But from a spiritual standpoint, I like it. But personally, I don't like being charged with with this kind of message of like high accountability and I don't really have a, a free will at all. It's just, I, I, I gotta engage in, 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 in this process of a lot of high expectations and, and a lot of ineptitudes of my own sinful nature that, that preclude, me, preclude me and then prevent me from continuously serving him the way that he's clearly making it known that it's required of me, it, it's gut-wrenching. It's destroying to my personal self-confidence that I have no way of, of achieving some, then he reminds me, it's not about your self-confidence or about your ability to, no, no, I'm your confidence, he would say. You have me. The fact that I've even charged you with this, that's where you get your pride and confidence from. That's what he means by in all things you boast in Christ because he's got your hand so closely on you. He's got, it's like basic training for the military. You don't complain because it's gut-wrenching and heartaching and physically demanding. You realize that you're about to be made into a soldier, but it takes that physical change and alteration of mindset to get to a level of, of where they want you at. God's doing that to us. We're not, we're not just anybody in Christ. We're his, we're his uh, Navy SEAL type people. He, he wants us to have some extreme training regimen. Don't quit. So in verse four, four, after naming the six things, again, I'm gonna go over them again, I'll write them on the board. But he says, number one, do, we need to stop laying the foundation again. Don't, don't again, have this, again, kata lambanoi, the emphasizer, kata, the foundation, that one, the one that's specific to you, mature ones, which you, you know, we have a double layer foundation. We have the foundation reconciled in Christ as our Paschal Lamb, having peace with him and the sporos. Then we know that we've been born again to his sperma word, his words become alive to us. He goes, would you stop regurgitating as if that's the earmark of what makes you, we know that's what makes you you, but stop making that what defines you. That does not define you. That's part of you. That's a gift from Almighty God. Move along, little man, move along. That's like being proud of your heritage, of your nationality, you're, you're, you're oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Scandinavian, I'm, I'm this, uh, okay, move along, little man, move along. And that means what in the whole scheme of things? So, that's great, that's great. It, it is good, it is good to be proud of your heritage, but don't do it in such a way that it supersedes what you should really be proud and valued in, which is who you are in Christ, right? 
It's not about ones being bad. It's about the prioritization of value. That's the issue. So there he is. So OK, so be proud of who you are, absolutely. But don't make it the prioritization of your value, which in Christ and what he, who he is, what he's given matters more than anything your heritage gave you, your genealogy gave you, the whole genealogy tree gave you. It doesn't matter more than what you, who you are in Christ. That's what matters. Because that trumps any physical heritage bloodline you can ever trace back. Sorry, it just does. And I know that because he said the one new man, which is spiritual, trumps all. There's no bloodline to that except for, oh, there is, the bloodline of Christ. So kaboom, make that what you want to focus in on, okay? So then he says, don't, reformation from dead works, don't keep doing that. Then he says, or faith upon God. Yeah, we know that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah, God in Christ, the triune God. We know this. We know this. That's number two. Don't, don't continue to, to focus in on Christ and Christ crucified and making that all you want to ever talk about. It's good. It's fantastic. Be grateful for it. Don't, don't minimize it. But stop talking about what defines you and talk about what <laughs> who he is in your life and what he expects from you because of it. Number three, he says, the immersions. Don't talk about how God prepared you or God gave you an idea of how to approach him versus when you used to think the way you used to think and now the way you think now at deeper levels. That, that's okay. That's great, but stop focusing in on how God changed your mindset or prepared your mindset or from John the Baptist and, and, and cursory symbolism to in Christ later. Fourthly, don't talk about laying on of hands, how God set you aside like the apostle uh, Paul set aside people and trained them for three months in Tyrannus. Later on, taught them in Ephesus for three years. We get it. God uniquely educated and taught you and raised you up. Like he laid hands on the apostles. He laid hands on you. He set you aside. He called you out for a particular reason. Yes, we know that. Yes, 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 yes. We never see the apostles ever say to themselves, pounding on their chest, that they're greater than the other 70 that Jesus called in Luke 10. We never once hear them ever bring up a comparison to those people. Not once. Not ever. They didn't need to. They didn't have to. They were comfortable in their own skin. They knew who they were. So don't get all caught up in the laying on of hands. They know who laid on hands on them. We know God's called you. You know, you know when God's given you what he's given you. Don't, don't worry. No one else values it. It doesn't matter. You know. It's like the apostles knew. They were comfortable in their own skin with who God made them, who God called them to be. I don't care if anyone recognizes it or not. They know and God knows. And some of the apostles were not recognized for who they were, and they were disdained for it. Didn't change the fact they still have their same faith and conviction of who called them and why they were called. Period. Done. End of conversation. They, were, they, they didn't keep talking about it all the time, making that what defined them. That wasn't their message every single time. They referenced it and went on. Then he says, not just laying on of hands, but he says, then the resurrections of the dead ones. He had the different bodies of, of natural and spiritual and solical, glorious bodies. Yeah, sure. Flesh, blood, and bone, with sin, out sin. Yeah, he knows. He's like, yeah, we, we understand his resurrections. We understand that. But let's make sure it doesn't define you. And only in judgment. Yep, we know the demon seat is going to be a time of recompense of negativity, recompense of reward. We understand there's a lot of stake. There's, there's a giving and taking, those who have, those who have not. We understand that. There's some pain and suffering, some glorious benefits. Yep, don't let that define you. Don't let that be what you believe and what you consistently want to talk about. This is why I have a weakness in my sinful flesh. I, I never like it. Even though all those subject matters are biblically sound, they're biblically awesome, they're biblically true, they're biblically important to value and appreciate, none of them justify you camping out and making your entire life's work be nothing but that. It doesn't justify it. Sorry, it doesn't. And how do I know that? Because he said so. I didn't say so. God said so. God said, send it away, move along. The word he uses is progress in English, but the word in the Greek is actually, uh, the send away is apithos, and then he says to progress, which is paromethia, which is to bear forth, to forego, to continue to bear up. In other words, you take it, it's like, again, <laughs> imagine a guy carrying a weight, atlas, if you will, the old imagery, right? And you, you just, it gets heavier, but you continue to, to carry it. You don't stop and go, Look at that. Look what I just did. Blah, blah. You're not in a gym. You're not in a gym. You're not trying to peacock here. Stop it. Your job is to do the process of carrying the weight. 
For what, for what purpose? To place at the end of your life your works before, before Christ at the Bema seat, see where it washes out for you. Bear up, forge ahead, he says, progress. Send away the thoughts of these old doctrines and forge ahead, progress. Carry the weight of, yes, how much you want to talk about those things and, and make that define you. You know it's tempting. We have books written about it that are great to have, but there shouldn't be just that. If a person was an author of a book, say it was John Doe, and all John Doe wrote is about the Bema seat of Christ, part one. We see the Christ, part two, part three, and so on. And it's all they wrote about. They're in violation. And violation as a mature one to Hebrews chapter six. Total violation. You just, you just committed, the, you just committed the, the warning, the sin against the warning. He tells you not to do that. Talk about it, write about it, fine. Continue to satiate over it and just get camped out over it. Wrong. He tells you that. Wrong, 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 wrong. Same as resurrection of the bodies, same as the immersion, same as laying of hands, same as faith upon Jesus, same as the Reformation dead works. I, I didn't write the book. And then he says in verse 4 of chapter 6 of Hebrews, For those once enlightened, that means those who have been again, they have been aware of the insights to the mysteries and secrets. Yes. Yep, I believe they do, hey, hey, they do that because they can't see. Be I have a guy that I know that, I know people that I know that all they talk about is the, uh, the Daniel 70th week. It's all they discuss, the Daniel 70th week. And they, it's all they see, it's all they know. And they do it for different reasons. I'm going to be nice. I don't read their mind, don't read their heart, I don't read their spiritual mail. I don't know what's going on inside them. But I do know this, from what I've seen from just ascertaining what they have said and what they have written. They, one, don't understand the truth at all. Two, they're very arrogant and don't want to hear any other understanding of what it is that could be different because they believe they're the end of all. They got a full, complete knowledge of what it means. And thirdly, they constantly change and shift to continue to keep it fresh with nuances of things in science or in social media or in churchianity culture. They have those three things in common. All three of them make me want to vomit. I could care less. I could care less. I, I don't. That's why you don't, you don't see me every single time I give a message to you saying, go back and read this page of your book that I, that I gave you. Go back. And, I don't do that. That book, again, I did the book because I did not want to have whatever God gave me die with me. And I wanted it in a book, number one. Number two, I was sick and tired, personally, of my own sinful flesh getting involved. And someone said, bye, 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 bye. what about this? And I would just say, fine, I'm not going to argue with it. Here, read this. If you want to burn it, trash it, shred it, have fun with it. I, I don't really want to talk about it anymore. Read that, and um, there's my answer. That's why I did it, to, def to basically detract away from indifferences of, of malice. I don't want to sow discord among brethren. I want to argue. I'm I don't want to do that. I want to say, here you go. I'm done. And secondly, I wanted to have the truth that God gave me, not die with me. That's it. And then thirdly, it's becoming more of I want to make sure that I'm helping people to understand. But that's about it. That's it. That's as far as it goes. I want no praise, no attention, none of that stuff. I don't, I don't want to keep on focusing on the book. I, I hate, I don't want to keep doing that. But and that's why I don't do that. Yes? And you said it brings attention to them in their flesh. It does. It does. And so I, mean, I can just tell you that and that's a problem. So that's a problem for me. But I think it's because they don't, and the main thing that Sister Pam said is that's all they see. But because that's all they see, they compare that to what other people don't see, and they see the uniqueness as, as, a, as, a, as a minority of people don't see it or see it their way, but they don't see it exactly their way. So they begin to pride themselves on the uniqueness to then bring forth attention and other things that come with that. Benefits of financial and power and prestige and influence and things like this. And it's just unfortunate that they think that way. It, but, but it is what they do. They, they see something that comparatively isn't talked about as much, or if it is, is not talked about in that specific way, so that they begin to believe that it's worthy of camping out on. Nothing in a specific doctrine is worth camping out on. That the, the what's worth camping out on are, God tells you, him, which is not a doctrine, that's him. That's a personal relationship, him and his book. That's not a doctrine, 
I'd say the living, breathing book. It's the living word of God. Those are the two things being worth camping out on. Him and his word, that's it. Which is the totality of who he is and the totality of his word. Not a specific piece of him or a specific part of his word. No, no, no. The totality of who God is and the totality of his word. Camp out on that. And then with that, camp out on and dissecting, intersecting how the book is supposed to cut you open and see yourself for what you are. Camp out on that. And for the purpose of how out ahead of you, how the change he's forging in you now is going to exact the reality later, camp out on that. <laughs> but not specific things he gave you along the way that then you just, because that, that, that does it, limits your thinking. It limits the work he's doing on you to restore you, to heal you, to help you, to encourage you, to correct you. You're hindering yourself. You're hamstringing yourself. It's like refusing to bring a, a writing utensil to class and the teacher continues to tell you, you need to take notes. You go, I got it all here. I got it all here. I got it all here. Okay. And you keep on getting bad grades on the test. And they've told you and they told you and they told you. You need to bring a utensil. No, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Fine. 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 Keep, keep having it your way. I'm not going to, you know what? It's like in a college course. You paid to come here. You pay to fail. That's on you. Just like in, in Christ. Christ gave you the insights to his word. You want to throw it away and discard it? That's on you. Hebrews is telling you, don't blame him when you end up getting frustrated, knowing that you were given a privilege that only a few were given, and you thought nothing of it. You thought it was a throwaway. Well, then 